to win. Visions of speed, the sea, pounding spray, man against the elements, this is the view most of us have. Today, powerboat racing is a highly specialized sport, attracting enthusiasts all over the world. One of the leading enthusiasts, Tommy Sopwith, explains what attracted him to the sport. Powerboat racing, I suppose it's part of the challenge of team together to try and do something better than someone else. The race itself, of course, is only the last 10 or 15 percent of it. This whole thing starts with Don Shedd at the design stage, watching the boat being built, working out what other people are doing, trying to do something either different or what they're doing and better. It's a whole sort of world of its own, really. It's a world of specialists, designers, mechanics, seamen, builders. Don Shedd, one of the world's top designers, is constantly asked to achieve the impossible, working at the extremes of knowledge, forcing the pace searching for the new breakthrough. But the sea is unpredictable. A boat must be big enough to be competitive in the rough and fast enough in the calm, which means compromise, striking a balance between speed and sea keeping, striving to increase the power to weight ratio. One of the first decisions a designer must make is what material to use, considering weight, price, strength. Wood is the traditional building material. These are action models for high-speed cruising. In the past, you could use one of these boats both as a pleasure cruiser and win races. But today, that's gone. Racing power boats are specially designed. Before each season, a months and months of preparation, exacting trials, and meticulous planning. Apart from the conventional wooden construction, there's cold and hot molding. But new materials are being developed. Aluminium and glass fiber boats are proving successful, especially if you've got a production line. As we learn more and more about using aluminium, we shall see in the 70s reasonably priced, lightweight aluminium boats. As technology develops stronger and lighter materials, so the leading designers will incorporate these materials in the power boats of the future. the first boat built by Gulandris' Enfield Marine. She's an all-aluminium shed design boat, 33 feet in length, weighing much less than her conventional rivals, with a deep V hull, a class one boat, powered by twin 475 horsepower Mercruiser engines, capable of speeds up to 80 miles per hour. And to transmit the power of these big American engines to the propellers has been made possible with the recent breakthrough in the development of the Z drive, directing more power into the water. There are various types, shapes, and designs of propellers. Designer can alter three meters, diameter, pitch, and blade area to increase speed. But like all efficient designs, the propeller must be proved and tested. Telstar 403, previous winner of the Cars Torquay race. A class two shed design boat, length 25 feet, powered by a seven and a half liter Ford Daytona engine. Top speed near 70 miles per hour. In propeller development, both Telstar and Miss Enfield work in conjunction over a measured course. And this means endless hours spent at sea. Out to the measured mile. Each run means propeller changes, modifications, minute adjustments forever striving to increase speed and sea keeping to achieve a place in top powerboat events. One big advantage of the inboard outboard Z drive is that the angle of the propeller can be trimmed while underway. In the flat calm, you adjust it to lift the nose out of the water for greater speed. Or in the rough, you trim the nose down. The trim tabs are another method. These and ballast tanks enable the driver to trim his boat to the prevailing conditions. At first, powerboats had flat bottoms. Then Ray Hunt in America developed the deep V principle, which improved speed and sea keeping characteristics. Sonny Levy in Italy and Don Shedd in Britain incorporated this principle into their designs. 
And now the offshore powerboat world has made full use of the deep V hull. And this in turn has been handed on to production boats. After each trial, there are questions to be asked, problems to be solved, improvements to be considered, results to be analysed, a post-mortem on current developments. Tommy, is a hull any better since it's, back, since it's been back to Anfield Marine for modification? Oh, she's handling a hell of a lot better, particularly at high speeds. The level of panic's down by about 50%, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And how about the uh, tabs down? What's happening there? Well, they're now working fine, and we've got some indicators on so we can see where they are. See, that makes a colossal difference, certainly. Because yeah. now you can see both the tabs and the outdrive angles. Sure you seem to be going pretty quickly this morning when we were together on the measured mile. Well, we're in the sort of 78 area now, which is fine for this season. But knowing what we do about the plans that both the Americans and the Italians have got, we've got to get an awful lot faster than that for next year. All over the world, rivals set the Italy with the red and white tornadoes. America with the threat. And for Britain, a... A well-supported annual event in the powerboat world is the Class 3 Putney to Calais race, sponsored by WD and HO Wills. As in all competitions, there are certain standards to be met. Boats must be seaworthy and conform to safety regulations. A boat must have a fire extinguishing system, rubber dinghy, life jackets, crash helmets, first aid kit, radar reflector, and in the larger classes, radio. The responsibility rests on the scrutineers. And Lady Aaron, driver of Badger 4, accepts the badgering. She knows that scrutineering is an important section of pre-race preparation and it's part of their business to do a thorough job, checking and testing, making sure each boat is up to standard. Volare 2, driven by James Beard and powered by twin Evinrude engines. Is this catamaran the shape of things to come? Early Sunday morning, the next day, on the Thames at Putney, the weather doesn't look too good now. The crews assemble for briefing, and it's decided because of Force 5 conditions in the channel to shorten the course to Ramsgate and back. And with this news, the crews prepare for a wet trip with quite a few bumps. June the 8th, London. The fleet prepares for the start. The popularity of this unique Wills event, starting from the centre of the capital, is shown by 25 entries, including Flying Flea, Slipstream, Volare 2, and to cheer them up, Jersey Sunshine. The procession glides under the London bridges, on down the Thames, past familiar landmarks, the Houses of Parliament, the Embankment, and the Tower of London. And at Tower Bridge, it's a rolling start on a course heading downriver, out into the estuary, down to Ramsgate, and back up the Thames to finish at Tower Bridge. This is the fourth time in eight years that the race has been shortened because of bad weather, and it looks as though it's going to be a really tough battle for both boats and crews. 25 starters as they speed on downriver. Wicked Out number 56 is off to a good start, chased by Badger 4, driven by Lady Aaron. It's a tremendous battle as the boats move out into the estuary and along the Kent coast. James Beard's Volare 2 catching up as they thunder onto Ramsgate. Volare 2 keeping up the pressure, making up for a badly positioned start. 
but this weather makes the race hard going. Many boats have dropped out. But heading back from Ramsgate is 541, Scavenger in the lead, driven by Martin Jensen. And after Ramsgate, only 10 boats are left in the running. This race is certainly proving tough. Hellfire is well down in the field. These little boats are really taking a battering. What a welcoming sight the Thames must be as the boats thunder back up river. The officials, having missed the excitement, are waiting for the leader to appear. And here she comes, 541 Scavenger, roaring under Tower Bridge to take the chequered flag. And Martin Jensen brings Scavenger home to take first place. Under the bridge, in second place, comes 168 Bewitched, driven by Keith Horseman. Third came Blue Blood, and fourth was the Cat Volare II. Of 25 starters, only 10 finished. An exciting race shortened by rough weather, but a test of endurance for boats and crews. A week later, on the 14th of June, saw the start of another major powerboat event, the WD and H.O. Wills International, a race attracting the world's top class one and two boats. Into the water goes 141, the Rebel, driver Norman Ramsay, engines Volvo. Gathered at the mouth of the River Hamble are a cast of truly international celebrities. Timo Markinen, ace Finnish rally driver and Pasco Watson with Avenger 2, powered by three Mercruiser engines, and with engine capacity like this, 250 gallons, almost enough petrol to last the average family a year, won't last these boys long at a gallon a minute. Stop and think of it, 250 gallons at treble stamps. The Wills International is one of the two world championship races held in Britain, counting towards the world title. As well as attracting many British entries, like the Round Britain race winner Avenger 2, it attracts many overseas entries, including the Italians and the Swedes. Second in the Round Britain race, Tim Powell and Norman Barclay's UFO. Here are the power of its Holman Moody engine. World champion Vincenzo Balistrieri discusses the race with a fellow competitor. Number 21, Melodrama, arrives in time for the pre-race briefing. All the drivers attend this briefing by race officials. A race can be lost if insufficient attention is paid to navigation. Lady Aiken is experienced enough not to make this mistake. And courses and boys are carefully plotted. There's no chance to do this once underway. the briefing, the boats are prepared for the start. Volare 2, fully recovered from the last race. The Perkins diesel engine Sea Fox, built by Alan Bernard in his garage. And White Tornado, powered by two huge Mercruiser engines. The course, covering approximately 167 nautical miles, starts at South Sea Pier. Heads west down the Solent, to the Fairway Buoy, up to Branksome, past St Albans Point, into Weymouth Bay and round the Shambles Lightship to start the journey home. At the start, the sea is flat calm in contrast to the Putney Calais race. 23 starters, and we can look forward to a record-breaking event as the boats move up to the start. And they're off, in perfect conditions. Balistrieri's Red Tornado goes straight into the lead, followed by the rest of the fleet. 350, Avenger 2 is determined not to let him get away. But it's still the tornadoes out in front. The big boys are setting a cracking pace. 21, melodrama skimming along the surface. Timo Markinen and Pasco Watson are putting those three giant Mercruiser engines of Avenger 2s to work, piling on the power. And here's one of those easily identified floating objects, Norman Barclay's UFO. Senorita Mercedes moving beautifully. But it's Red Tornado well in the lead, in perfect conditions, heading up to Branksome. The Italians are not giving their rivals chance to catch up. Two eighty-eight Bullens Powerboat Magazine. The two Ford Ferry boats fight it out in a race of their own. A long way ahead of the rest of the field. Increasing his lead, the Italian world champion Balistrieri in Red Tornado. And what a boat, 31 feet in length, three tons of bouncing power. Closely followed by the other roaring tornado, number 89, driven by Constantino. 
Fighting for third position, Mike and James Beard in Volare 2, followed by the rest of the fleet. 291, Hellfire, well placed in her class. And closing the gap is Delta, wearing a false nose for Britain, joined by a couple of fairies. In second place, the White Tornado, hugging the Weymouth coast. The Rebel, 141. At the halfway mark, it's Balistrieri with Red Tornado well in the lead. The Shambles Lightship, halfway house, but there's no stopping this trip. From the lightship, the boats head east, back to Branksome. Out into the channel, past the Needles, round St. Catherine's Point to the Nab Tower, and up the Solent past Cows to turn again at Hillhead for the finish. In flat, calm seas, the two tornadoes look set for a record-breaking time. In third position, making a brave attempt to catch those whirlwind tornadoes, Volare 2 for Britain. Watch that cat go. Timo Markinen in Avenger 2 has his foot hard down. Out past the needles. It's full throttle all the way for Red Tornado. UFO doing well in fifth position. Hellfire. Senorita Mercedes. Volare 2, the outboard catamaran, still in third place. It's Balistrieri for Italy, proving the world champion that he is, roaring up the Solent in record-breaking style, passing the Hillhead boy with a world record-breaking average speed of over 70 miles per hour. In second place for Italy, Consentino in the White Tornado. And a long way behind the leaders in third place, Volare 2 for Britain. To achieve victory, a team has to be ahead not only in the race, but in design and development. This year, it's the Italian team. Can it be Britain next year? Well, power boating is essentially a team effort. This team is composed of, in the first stage, designers. Don produces the designs. Then you've got the building stage, the testing stage, which is terribly like motor racing. One's evaluating propellers in the sense that you evaluate axle ratios and rolling radii, wheels and tires in cars. The race itself is only the last 10 or 15 percent, and inevitably the driver gets most of the glamour at the end, but he really is the figurehead of a team, and this team is in business to win. Through its support and sponsorship of Powerboat Racing, WD and HO Wills offer world-class competition to the men who respond to the challenge of Powerboat Racing and go out to Powerboat to win. Thank you. 